No, I, oh yeah, I, I was going to say something about uh, about Jadot, we, the Green Party candidate. I oh, was, yeah, was so disappointed I couldn't talk about the Green Pedophiles. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, that's yeah. our listeners that's, love that's that some shit. Of, that's some of our main material. We're going to have a, we're gonna need to have a Green Pedophiles like mini series. Maybe yeah, not I mean, mini series. What's, Maybe like what, what's the pedophile series. connection for the Greens? Well, they, well the party that he he's running uh, under, Europe Ecologie Les Verts, so the Europe uh, Ecology of the Greens, was founded by Daniel Con Bendit, Danny ah, the Reds, yeah, that you were discussing yeah, a few we, weeks ago. We did, yeah. We had Lily Lynch on to talk about Danny the Red and his um, his odd behavior back in the sixties. So, yeah, that was a fantastic episode. I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, what a what a party it is. Um, I mean, four percent. So they'll have to pay back everything they borrowed as well, like Picasso. So that's a, that's a little win for um, against the the green pedos. <laughs> <laughs> we should start this as a as a cold open. Actually, just put this as a cold <laughs> open. But tell listeners, you're not going to hear any. That's it. That's it for green pedos. For today. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't. They didn't meet the the they didn't, <clears> exactly. requirement to be discussed in the rest of the program. That, enough, that's exactly it. Folks. Yeah. everyone. Bonjour, mes amis. Welcome to BungaCast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. This is our actually our five-year anniversary. We've done over 250 episodes since we began in 2017, aiming to explore the contours of the breakdown of the neoliberal order, how we're moving beyond the deadening end of history period, how politics might be returning, and how we might move beyond today's impasse. So we thought we'd just take this moment to pat ourselves on the back. Um, and also mention that we produced a book out of this, The End of the End of History, Politics in the 21st Century, which develops on the ideas we first advanced on the podcast. So if you haven't got yourself a copy yet, it's available in all good bookstores. And actually, I should announce that if you prefer to read in German, um, and excuse me for my pronunciation, but uh, Das Ende des Endes der Gesichte is now out from Pro Media in Austria. Um, and there'll be a translation in Italian coming soon, and hopefully other languages on the way as well. Um, Finally, if you've liked what we've done and uh, never reviewed this podcast, we would love it if you d do so. Uh, drop us five stars at iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, so it'll help other people discover BungaCast. Okay, so uh, to the matter at hand, this is a two-parter on the French presidential elections. The first round, as I'm sure you'll know, happened on Sunday, the 10th of April, and we're recording this on Wednesday, the 13th of April. So, and you're obviously hearing this first part on Tuesday with the second part due out 24 hours later on Wednesday, the 20th. So keep an eye out for that. Now I'm going to pass over to Phil, who's going to introduce our first guest. Thanks, Alex. So um, that was a terrible German pronunciation, incidentally. So it's mm, lucky it's we're not, doing... can't do German. It's lucky we're doing French today rather than German. So today our first guest on the french presidential election is my colleague from the university of kent from politics and international relations at the university of kent charles develin or charles develin who is senior lecturer in politics and international relations uh, just briefly i wanted to explain why um it's the first time we've had charles i mean we've talked about french politics before but it's the first time we're having charles um on the podcast or indeed any of my colleagues from the university and those of you who follow Follow me on Twitter, I might have seen that I've accepted a new position at UCL in London, so I'm due to be leaving Kent in the next few months. And the reason we've not had any of my colleagues from Kent on in the past is entirely for the integrity, for preserving the integrity of the pod. And so listeners could um, listen, so that listeners could listen to the pod without, um, with knowing that uh, we were uh, doing our best to be as objective as possible. 
So Charles is um, is his uh, specialism is in political theory and specifically in eight, the um, materialism of the French Enlightenment, the politics of um, 18th century French Enlightenment. Um, but more recently, he's moved into talking about contemporary French politics, including with a book on the Gilets Jaunes or the Yellow Vest movement in France that is um, roiled up French politics under the Macron presidency in the last few years um, and in the last five years, I should say, and um, something that we've spoken about on the podcast before as well. So uh, briefly, uh, Charles, could you just tell us a bit about your book on the Gilets Jaunes and what prompted you to write it and to shift away from um, your area, your area of expertise in the French Enlightenment? Yeah, of course. And thanks for having me on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. I do listen to you guys on occasion, so uh, I will um, hopefully be able to on draw occasion. some links. On well, occasion. Yeah, on occasion, on occasion. Um, so my book on the on the Gilets Jaunes, as you say, is quite different from my previous work, but um, I've always been interested in the kind of contemporary meaning of those historical works that I've been doing. So my, my interest on 18th century atheism began when I was thinking about the new atheism, right? So I always approached it from a kind of contemporary perspective. And it seemed to me that with Macron, we were entering a new era of French politics. And it became very apparent that um, the, the streets were reacting differently as well. And so that's what drew me in the first place to the yellow vest, the gilet jaune, as you say so, so well with your beautiful French accent. Uh, so yeah, the, the gilet jaune really was a, a way for me to look more closely at this, this period of French politics that has uh, been quite different from the past. Certainly, we're not in the kind of boring politics of François Hollande, the, the president before Macron. Uh, he was considered, he tried to be the, the president of, of normalcy. He tried to be a very low-key kind of figure. And it was um, it was a bit of a continuation of the same. But with Macron, we've seen a real acceleration of the neoliberal project. So some of the things that you refer to at, in the end of the end of history reading. So that's what drew me to him, uh, to the to the Gilets Jaunes in the first place. And then I guess the, the reverse of the medal is to look at Macron himself and to look at his project for France. And so you've got a book coming out shortly on or well due to come out and you're finalizing it in these last few weeks of the presidential election. That's and right. Can you tell us very quickly, can you tell us a bit about that book? It's a book on Macron's ideology, basically. So I wanted to have a look at uh, the way that he develops his ideas, both um, when he was a candidate, but also as a president and how he uh, constructs this new vision for France. And in very short, it's um, it, the idea is that Macron is really the neoliberal president of France. He's the kind of, uh, he's our Margaret Thatcher, if you want. He's uh, trying to dismantle the social welfare state as it exists in France. He's certainly not the first to do that. We can talk maybe a little bit more about that when we discuss the elections. But he's the fulfillment of neoliberalism. He's uh, completing what others on the left and right have tried to do before him. And he's much more successful at it. So I wanted to look at the ideological roots of that. So it's really it's still a book about political philosophy. It's a book about ideas. It's a book about how ideas are shaped by material conditions. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to write. Uh, a little bit stressful now at the end as I'm finishing it, but it's uh, certainly exciting times to be writing about it. Do you think it's um, do you think it's too crude to say that Macron won and the Gilets Jaunes lost? He 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 overcame them, and this is the. Um, you know, obviously we'll talk about some of the, the themes, I'm sure, from this this conflict, but like they're, they're in the past and he's he's in France's future. Yeah, it's a good question. I would put it the other way around, actually. I would say that they won. They were the only ones, the Gilets Jaunes, who managed to make him change his mind. See, he's notoriously stubborn. Uh, he's known for his little Macronade. I don't know if you've ever heard the term before. It's uh, these little sayings that that Macron is um, is famous for. So you know something like you only need to cross the street to find a job. Something like oh, if you want to find a job, buy a suit. When he was um, filmed in his 
office with golden furniture saying, oh, we're spending crazy dough on social welfare. Um, recently, just after the first round, he said to, uh, to a woman who was complaining about her kids' education during COVID, he said, you're not living in the real life. You know, these kinds of sayings that he has constantly towards the, the ordinary citizens that he's engaging with. So he's very, very stubborn. He has this attitude towards... Um, towards his fellow citizens. And then the Gilets Jaunes forced his hands. They're the only ones who actually managed to, to force him to spend more money on, uh, on social welfare. The only measures that he's introduced during his entire five years in office were a response to the Gilets Jaunes. Those were the only social mm. measures. So, um, I mean, I suppose I would, I would say, I think Mitterrand was probably Francis Thatcher more than Macron, but we can maybe come back to that. So I think all of our listeners will know by this point that the two-tiered or, um, or two-part aspect of the French presidential election is that you have a first round and a second round, and it's the two candidates who make it through the first round to go to the second round, and I expect everyone knows by now that it is Marine Le Pen, um, for the um, national rally on the one hand and Macron of La République en Marche on the other. Those are the two candidates that are going through. So apart from that, what else are the main takeaways from the results of the Sunday election, Charles, that you would uh, flag up? Yeah, I think the first thing is that it was predicted, right? The, the polls were roughly right. So that is the, the first thing to note, uh, is that actually we could rely more or less on the polls that were all, almost all predicting this, this result from the election, at least the few weeks before they were. So that's the first thing to note. The second thing to note is that um, the traditional parties uh, of the of the French state, so that's um, Les Républicains, that's the, our kind of the, the Tories, if you want, and the Parti Socialiste, so that's our, our version of Labour, have uh, completely collapsed. So together, they got 7% of the votes. The, um, the Socialists, who were, remember, they were in power five years ago, right? Five years ago, there was an election during the election, um, the socialists were in power and they got 2% this election. So to talk about the total collapse of the traditional parties. I mean, it was kind of expected. The socialists had already collapsed in 2017 with uh, 6% of the vote. But so now what's happened is that they've been joined by the right. And that's because Macron has taken their votes, right? Macron, after having hollowed out the socialist party of their bourgeois bloc people, so um, you know the the kind of middle class supporters of the of the petty bourgeois socialist party, uh, after having done that in 2017, Macron has now done the same thing to the right. So he's completely hollowed out these two parties from their members, and um, you know his two prime ministers were from the right wing conservative party. Um, they they join him in his endeavor. But the the Republicans, the, the Pécresse's party, ha, are gone. Um, what's quite hilarious out of this whole situation is that on Monday after the the elections, the day after, she was begging for money on television because she has a personal loan of five million euros that no that she will not get reimbursed because she didn't meet the five percent <laughs> threshold. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. I mean, I, she has a personal fortune, so I, I think she can sell a couple of her properties and she'll be fine. But I was worried there for a minute that she might be like, you know, turfed out onto the street and be reduced like in her material circumstances. But I'm re I'm sure reassured now. That's good news. Um, just talking about the polls, I noted that kind of looking at tracking it over the past month or so um, and in relation to what the candidates actually achieved, that you saw Zemmour of the far right kind of falling precipitously and, and Le Pen rising in equal proportion. So you can imagine that those votes shifted um, from one to the other. And similarly, as you've already described, how Pécresse of the traditional centre-right fell and that Macron was able to scoop up those votes. But then also Mélenchon rose quite significantly in the polls. To, I mean, I think he rose from something like 13% to, to eventually finishing with 20%. And those votes don't seem to obviously come from another candidate. Um, so where did those votes actually come from? Were those people who were previously undecided? Yeah, so the um, the Mélenchon votes uh, came par partly from the other parties of the left. So there was um, a useful vote, as, um, as it was called. So uh, as the polls were seeing him rise, he was... He 
obviously became the candidate of the left, like he was in 2017. So a lot of people who don't like him, particularly, who would have voted socialist or would have voted for the Greens or uh, would have voted for the Communist Party that ran a candidate this time, um, they voted for uh, for Mélenchon. At least quite a few of them did. Uh, it's pretty clear in um, in the data that we have since the election. So a lot of people voted for a candidate they didn't particularly like, but because they thought, oh, actually, you know, he's the the only left wing candidate that can reach the second round. Yeah. So there was some kind of um, feverish commentary on Twitter about how. Mélenchon missed the, you know, he missed just by a couple of percentage points from going through into the second round and potentially overthrowing global capitalism. So obviously there was a lot of kind of disappointment on Twitter, a few percentage points away from the consummation of all our hopes and dreams. We'll come back to Mélenchon. So, so I know, right? Um, Mélenchon is the third candidate, I suppose. I mean, he won't be going through to the second round, but the fact that he reached third place in the rankings is important for how the second round falls out. So um, beyond the kind of the polls and the rankings of the candidates and what have you, is there anything that is um, less visible from outside of France or something which you think is important to understand about these dynamics? but which would be difficult to say if you weren't um, following the French press or if you weren't uh, in, you know, within the context of French politics and national life. Yeah, and, and I know you'll be talking with Chris later on about looking forward, but I think one of the things that that is quite visible already in the results of the first round, and I think isn't as clear on this side of the of the English channel, is that Macron is really despised by a lot of people. And this is independent of party or party affiliation or even social class. So just to give you a, a kind of personal example, one of my cousins who's, um, he works in Paris, he's a kind of executive in the in the tech industry. So not exactly, you know, uh, a kind of um, leftist revolutionary. Not, but not he, a gilet jaune supporter. Not a gilet jaune either. But he went, during the gilet jaune, he went to the May Day demonstration because he's, you know, slightly on the left of the political spectrum. So he was like, ah, oh, let's have a day out. And so he went to the demonstration in Paris and they were cornered by the police. They were, um, they just had tear gas in their face for, he doesn't know how long because he kind of, he blacked out during that time. And he was with his girlfriend and she had a panic attack. And, you know, they, they saw the police kind of closing in on them and they managed to escape relatively unharmed apart from the, the tear gas. But this was the traditional kind of workers rally demonstration. You walk through Paris, it's quite jovial. People go there with their families and they, you know, have a like a, have have some sweets or like there are there's plenty of like folkloric activities going on uh, during those rallies. And they were basically um attacked by police and they they felt it very strongly and when macron denied that there was anything like police violence in france he said he really felt a hatred for his president and so you can see okay the gilet jaune you can understand that but there are other people who share that um, that perspective also mm -hmm. and i think that is that doesn't transpire especially if you're like me read the ft right you're like oh well like macron is going to save us from this kind of torrent of nationalism in europe and that's not at all how it's perceived in France. He's perceived as a, a president that has mutilated and killed his own citizens. He's perceived as someone who pushes through reforms without any consultation with traditional social actors. And he's perceived really as someone who, has, um, who is completely on the right of the political spectrum, not, not at all anymore, at least. Maybe in 2017, he was still seen as a centrist candidate but as a president he's he's perceived as a as a right-wing president it's uh it's completely obvious to anyone in uh, in french politics today so uh, that takes us i guess to a follow-on question is um if you could give us a sense of the demographics that are voting for which candidate and if there is um so one thing that came across from your book on the gilet jaune um, which I'd recommend to all our listeners and you'll find in the show notes. Um, but one thing you mentioned there was their determination um, to not be captured by any political, existing political party. So I wondered if there was, um, if the Gilets jaunes have voted, um, so to speak, and if so, who they voted for. And if you can also give us kind of a demographic breakdown of electoral, what the electoral strongholds of the major candidates look like. Yeah, I mean it's quite a complex picture, as uh, as is always the case. But um, so to start with uh, with the yellow vest, the gilet jaune, they of course some of them voted, but no one has captured the movement. So many people have tried. 
uh, in particular the um, the anti Macron parties because um, because they they are all against Macron. So I I really doubt that any significant number of of gilets jaunes voted for him. But other than that, they haven't really been captured by anyone in particular. Uh, Marine Le Pen has tried, Jean-Luc Mélenchon has tried, and it's pretty clear that they're not buying it. So um, they're not they're not flocking en masse to any particular party. There was even a, a Yellow Vest party um, at the European elections in 2019, I believe, and it was a flop, like they got almost no votes. So um, again, even from a kind of internal structure of the Yellow Vest, there wasn't um, a clear political um, political agenda. And you look at the demographics and they're fairly representative of the rest of French society. So some of them voted for, at the time it was, you know, the, the Front National in 2017, now the, the, the National Rally of Le Pen. Uh, some of them voted for Mélenchon, some of them voted for Macron, you know, they, it's pretty diverse, basically. When it comes to um, the kind of second part of your question about the, um, the demographics of the other candidates, it's pretty clear that you know there's a, a kind of it's a it's a three person race this year. Okay, so now we know the third person is out, but we can see that uh, the young people, uh, those who are below 35, I feel old just saying that, but young people have voted for Mélenchon. The middle age from 35 to 60 roughly have voted uh, for Le Pen, and the ones who are above 60 the, are have voted for Macron. So Macron's electorate has largely shifted, actually. That's also kind of interesting from an outside perspective, is that we see that he's gained votes, but actually he's changed also a lot of his electorates. So when you look at the people who voted for him five years ago, many of them didn't vote for him, but then he gained new voters, many new voters in the meantime, in particular the wealthy and retired um, people of France who are now flocking to him en masse. Uh, they already have their retirement secured, so you know it doesn't matter. Any reform to future retirement is completely irrelevant to them. Um, he's introduced some nice ties tax breaks for, for the richest in, in French society, particularly the top 1%. So that, again, very good for, for a small segment of the population that didn't necessarily vote for him the first time around. And for Le Pen, what does the breakdown, aside from the age, is um, what does her support base look like? Yeah, so she's. I can give you an example from um, from the the village where my parents live in France, which is in the in the Lot in the southwest of France. It's kind of it's very rural. It's kind of peri-urban. There's a small city nearby, about like. Um, uh, five kilometers away, uh, but it's a tiny little village, and the vote is is kind of split there between Mélenchon supporters and Le Pen supporters. And when you look at the map of France, you see that Le Pen has her support in the countryside or in those peri-urban areas. So actually, areas where the Gilets Jaunes were quite uh, active and quite uh, quite popular. So um, you know, Le Pen has done very well in in that in that type of demographic. People who live outside the big metropolitan centers. People who live in in areas where you need your car to go to work, for example, that was a big big thing during the yellow vest protest, and um, and hasn't done very well in the cities. And the cities have have voted more for the other two main main candidates, but um, yeah, a lot of people live in the in those peri urban areas in the uh, uh, the the place that um, you know the, the geographers call the, this kind of this diagonal that crosses France and it, where there is very low population density. So these these areas of of rurality or, or semi-urban areas uh, have flocked to Le Pen, really. And am I right in thinking that she's the candidate of the French workers at the moment? Working class, if you're working class, you're more likely to vote for Le Pen. That was what I read off the, um, off the charts that I saw. Is that correct? Yes and no. Yes, in that it's, um, it's, she's most definitely uh, the, the first vote among the parties for the French working class, but the French working class don't vote. But they vote very little. They mostly they abstain, and um, and we'll see that. I think this will be the crucial element for the second round of the election: is how many of them can be motivated to vote, and how many of them can be motivated to vote uh, against Le Pen. And I'm a little bit a little bit skeptical about about that dynamic because, um, uh, as you say, you know they are kind of the first. They're the first party of. Of those who are who are voted for, but really, I think my analysis, and we have to go back to Mélenchon for this, but my analysis is that 
uh, a lot of that abstention is working class voters that are disillusioned with the left but haven't bought into the to the discourse of Le Pen. So it's it's really the failure of Mélenchon to not have mobilized more of those uh, yeah. because I think they're his kind of natural electorate. They were people who used to vote for the French Communist Party, for example, and have not switched to um I've not switched to voting for for Mélenchon or for any other party of the left. Mm. So and, I'm curious. Yeah, go on, Alex. I, I mean, just as to the geography of these uh, places, which um, are the base for the Gilets Jaunes, um, vote largely to, for Le Pen, often sometimes deindustrialized areas with high unemployment. I think. I mean, what's the sort of class makeup of of a lot of these places of vote? I mean, I presumably there's some more traditionalist middle, you know, middle class or petty bourgeois small towns who vote for. Le Pen, but there's also kind of a lot of, you know, deindustrialized working class areas. How does that kind of breakdown look or is there, or is it kind of both? Yeah. So you have like those really nice chic villages that you're likely to go to if you, if you go on a road trip through France, these obviously uh, are, are much closer to, um, uh, to Macron than they are to Le Pen. What we're seeing in these sort of peri-urban villages of France is uh, is the not so nice villages, right? The ones that are just on the edge of a city. They're maybe 10, 15 kilometers from the city center. They're the France of roundabouts, I think is the best way to describe it. Mm. It's like this, this France that has been um, shaped since really the 1980s with this new uh, architectural design that was the roundabout. And you see thousands of them in France now. They're on the edge of cities. This is where the big supermarkets are, all the commercial places, the industrial areas outside of cities, and they live beyond those. So they live beyond those. Typically, they're um, you know, small property owners. So they will uh, own a, what you know, we call a bungalow. So like a, a kind of single story house, relatively small, usually built with uh, relatively cheap materials on a, on a new plot of land. And you see hundreds of those in the, in the villages of France that have sprung up in the, in the past couple of decades. And these are you know, people who basically have a job, right? So they can have a mortgage, but they are very dependent on, on energy prices, price of fuel, et cetera. And correct me if I'm wrong. France has the like highest proportion of big box retailers in Europe, or something like that. Is that is that true? Because um, that that's something which is striking and which is um, maybe goes against people's maybe slightly romanticized image of what France looks like, or especially rural France and the outside of you know. I think it's like cute traditional little villages, like you mentioned, the ones you might go on on a road trip. But um, it looks much more places that Alex American, goes basically. on holiday as well. Yeah. I, don't worry, I go on holiday there as well. I mean, they're lovely, those cute villages. But yes, I go visit not... big box retailers in, in the outside of major cities, actually. That's um, that's what I like to do. On <laughs> well, you certainly have very cheap wine there. So you'll, you'll easily find a decent bottle for two euros, I'm, I'm, which I'm is sorry. very cheap. But um, no, yeah, you're absolutely right that you have those those big supermarkets um, that are, uh, you know, basically have ruined the the traditional uh, small town and villages, uh, and especially in the in the village centers. If you're not looking at a, a cute historical village, it's empty now. There used to be a butchers. There used to be. Uh, a baker, there used to be a kind of uh, a bar, there used to be like little businesses in the in the center of towns. And now everything has been relocated to the outside. And so many, so many of these villages have have lost the, the basic necessities within the village. And so they have to drive um, to, uh, to these kind of big industrial areas around roundabouts. Right? And that is why the Gilets Jaunes started at the roundabout, because it was so symbolic of this type of France this type of friends that lives on the roundabouts. So you made a Twitter thread, um, which is very useful. And again, uh, listeners will find it in the show notes, making the case that programmatically against kind of all the, um, you know, all the kind of overheated rhetoric about fascism versus liberalism, ultranationalism and racism versus decency and European kind of values and what have you. But if you look at the manifestos and the programs of um, Macron and Le Pen, they're actually very similar. 
And so I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about um, the similarity of their programs and how important you think that is, because obviously, you know, manifestos and elections, actual policies, you know, and what administrations do can look very different. Um, and also just to pick up on something you said, I went, wondered if you could follow through a bit more when you said, so if people over 60 voted for Macron, are they, I mean, surely there's a tranche of them who would suffer from Macron's pension reforms that he's trying to drive through and uh, that are the, one of the most controversial aspects of his program. So how, why would it be pensioners voting for depriving themselves of, um, of uh, the benefits of uh, pensions, which Macron wants to decimate? Yeah, so maybe I'll take your questions in the reverse order, because I think the first one is the easiest one to, to answer, in that most people over 60 are already retired in France. Right, The retirement age at the moment is around 60, 62, depending a little bit. Uh, so if you're over 60, you know, except if you're right on the 60 margin, you're already retired. And so the changes won't affect you. So, um, you know, they, they are not that bothered. And of course, some of them will suffer because, you know, uh, of course, some, some of the policies will affect them anyway. But I'm talking in, in, large, in large numbers, right? Of course, there are, there are people over 60 who vote Mélenchon. There are, uh, there are people, you know, uh, 18 and over who vote for the Front National, like uh, the Rassemblement National now. Um, so, yeah, of course, you know, they, there's a lot of nuance in this. But in, in the aggregate numbers, they don't stand to lose much, those over 60. They're also the wealthy, right? Like in most Western and post-industrial societies, the people who are over 60 have most of the wealth in society. Uh, they have the pension funds, they have the houses, they have the properties, they have the, the, the stocks and bonds. So you know, they stand the most to win as well from um, a kind of pro-business um, and um and pro dividends uh, party as well that um, that Macron has been heading. Um, so yeah, that was um, that's kind of my answer to the second question. What was the sorry? What was the first one again? It was your Twitter thread about the oh, programs. Right, yeah. yeah, so about the programs between Le Pen and uh, and Macron, I think it's very interesting to note that um, this is uh, exactly what Macron wanted, right? This kind of standoff is exactly what he wanted in the first place. It's what he's been campaigning for, is what he's been fighting for. It's how he's framed the entire election, is how he's actually framed his entire political mandate, that there's only an alternative between him and barbarism, right? It's, uh, it's either Macron or the fascists. And I think that's a very disingenuous picture because uh, of several reasons, partly because he's introduced a lot of reforms that are extremely authoritarian, um, reforms on um, on law of, of on separatism, for example, um, his reforms on, um, on making the state of exception permanent into French law. Um, so these are extremely damaging for, um, for democracy generally. And to portray him as a candidate of, of democracy versus Le Pen as a candidate of fascism is disingenuous. And so I was interested in, in seeing what the actual programs um, actually uh, call for. And when you look at them, uh, Marine Le Pen's program is surprisingly boring. It's surprisingly close to Macron's. It's surprisingly, you know, not proposing anything that would resemble any form of national sovereignty. So, for example, she's completely dropped the idea of Frexit, of France leaving the European Union. She's completely dropped the idea of, uh, of monetary independence, for example, by uh, strengthening the Banque de France versus uh, the European Central Bank. And she's completely dropped uh, the idea of, of protecting the welfare state. What she's doing at the moment between the two rounds of the election uh, is she's, she's saying that she is a candidate of the welfare state, right? So she's trying to outflank Macron on the, on the left on those policies. But that's not at all what's in her program. Her program is completely a, a, a continuation of neoliberalism. And that's why it's so boring, because it's actually it's... It's Macron too, really, 
That's the economic program that we have. Now, I don't, I'm not saying that there is no racism in her party. Of course there is. I'm not saying that there's not you know, some kind of um, extremism. And, and I think that will motivate some people to vote against her uh, for sure. But economically, it's, it's no better than Macron's. It's no worse. It's just about the same. You've mentioned so many, or well, it's it has been mentioned, I should say. So Macron was famous for casting himself in as the need for what he called the Jupiterian presidency. This was some years ago, and again, this was very much in keeping with his um, astonish this remarkable kind of insouciant high handedness. Um, and I wonder now, he's so far he's refused to partake in any debates, though he is due to have a debate with um, Le Pen in advance of the of the second round. But I wonder, given the fact that there's only now five percentage points between them after the first round, it was 28 for Macron versus um, 23 for roughly for Le Pen. Um, and that the polls for the second round at the moment put them within a couple of percentage points at most. Is there any sign of panic in the Macron camp that they've been too complacent in refusing to really kind of um, campaign and pull their sleeves up, as it were? Yeah, I, th I think there is. I think there's a lot of panic in his camp. There is also, as you rightly note, some arrogance. So this Jupiterian presidency, you know, killing, calling himself the, the kind of king of the gods, basically, is, uh, is megalomaniac, to say the least. So he's... He's both arrogant and panicking, which is a very, uh, very bad combination, in my opinion, uh, in the first instance, because his arrogance means he's continuing his kind of macronade that I was uh, that I was talking about at, at the beginning. He's continuing to basically insult people that he's meeting in the street for being too ordinary. Um, he's pushing through his program. So he's made a, a, a kind of slight slight opening on the pensions reform, saying, oh, maybe it won't be 65 years old. It might be 64 years old, the, the, the year you can, you can retire. But, you know, that's, that's minimal, right? He's, he's really planning to push it through. And he's, he's trying to explain to us why we're wrong in not liking his program. Uh, that's his strategy at the moment in between the two rounds. So it's, it's very early days still, but at the what, same what time. Is the, what is the evidence of panic, though, specifically? The, well, I mean, the the evidence of panic is that uh, he's he's scrambling. He's he's going to to meet people, which he refused to do before the second round. He's agreed to a debate that will happen on the on the twentieth of April. So after this this um, podcast is recorded, and um, and that he's um, uh, he's making concessions. He's um, he's saying he you know he's open to renegotiating the the pensions reform, which he's been trying to push through for years. It was only delayed because of COVID. Really, it was actually passed through Parliament, so the law has already passed, but they they delayed the implementation of the reform because COVID really kind of messed up their their political agenda. Um, so so you know why delay or why renegotiate a reform he's already passed through Parliament? Right, that's a sign of panic. He's he's not uh, he's not acting as if he's already won the election, which it's true he hasn't. You know, some polls. There was one poll between the just before the second round that actually puts Marine Le Pen ahead of him. Now, it's only one poll among many, but that's very that's a, that's very unique. There hasn't been a poll like that ever in previous elections, and this is the third election of the, of the last five where there's an extreme right leader that makes it to the second round. Mm. So three out of five, I think people are tired of the anti-fascist vote. I think people aren't quite buying it, especially when you see that the differences between the two candidates aren't as big as, as they pretend to be. And so unless he can convince that there is a positive reason for people to actually vote for, uh, for him, I don't think a vote against Le Pen will work this time. That's really interesting. I mean, I, there's a lot of reporting and discussion, at least the foreign press, about how much kind of the Ukraine war might play in this. And I'm always kind of skeptical about how much foreign affairs play in, in, um, in national elections, especially ones like this. But in this case, maybe there's an argument that there is. I, what is your take on it? I mean, there's talk that, oh, because of um, Le Pen's association with Putin over a long period of time, that that has maybe harming her in the polls. I, I, I'm always skeptical of those claims. So what do you think of it? Yeah, I'm like you, Alex. I'm very skeptical 
Um, I don't think it it will have a huge incidence on on her voters for sure. Uh, I don't think it will um, it will really play a huge part in people's decisions. Um, it might play a bit of a part. I think it has already played a little bit of a part in the first round. We see that Macron was actually um, you know polling at around twenty five percent, and he got close to twenty eight in the end. So. Um, you know, there was a bit of a boost, and that boost was clearly, at least in the polls, it was visible uh, from the the beginning of the war in Ukraine. So I think there has been already because he, he was sort of playing as a playing kind of statesman statesman figure. Is that it? Yeah, absolutely. So he's the one who is speaking with world leaders. He's a candidate of stability. Um, he's the one who can maybe broker a, a deal with with Putin over this because he's been talking to him quite quite a lot, uh, both before and after the invasion. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's his strategy is to show that he's really the only choice for a, a stable and and secure Europe. So both um, both. Macron and Le Pen have to pitch for Mélenchon's voters, Mélenchon coming in third. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to put you in a kind of, uh, to ask you to kind of engage in a little thought experiment, which is, what would you say if you were Macron and if you were Le Pen? So what would you say to Mélenchon voters to get their votes? And if you could also give us the figures on, you know, how many we're talking about. And just for the sake of just for our listeners benefit. Um, so Mélenchon in the came once again in the previous um, in the previous election five years ago, Mélenchon came very close to getting through into the second round. And he was widely criticized at the time because he refused to endorse Macron as the candidate against Le Pen. He was very criticized by both liberals on the left. And this time round, he has been um Somewhat more, uh, he's said not one vote for Le Pen, but thus far he's also refused again, once again, refused to endorse Macron. But presumably, so I guess the question is how many of his voters will break for one or the other and how many of his voters will abstain? But if you were Macron, what would you say to Mélenchon voters to win them over? And if you were Le Pen, what would you say? You can use accents if, if you want or not. <laughs> yeah, that would be, yeah, by all means, by all uh, means, use accents, but also not not like what you think they will do, but what they should do. That's a, it's a difficult thought experiment, but um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to do it. I think, so. And do it, do it with the Macron accent if you oh, I, I can't imitate him. I'm terrible at imitations, especially, especially in another language that's, uh, although he does speak English, so. Uh, no, he he would say something like he could say something like, "I promise you, my my fellow citizens, that we will have a prime minister from the left." So Macron has had two prime ministers from the right. He was supposed to be the uh, the candidate of um, of the at the same time that was. Is saying en même temps in French at the same time. So he was both left and right. He was at the same time from the left and at the same time from the right. And he's had two different prime ministers, and they're both for, they were both from the right. If he's serious about uh, introducing more reforms on the left, then he could promise uh, a left wing prime minister. Uh, that would that would win him votes, but he, I think. And so he can appoint as the president. He has the power to appoint a prime minister who would be a candidate from a left wing party. Yeah, they'd have to enter into a coalition uh, with, um, obviously, with uh, with the person. So it would be it would be a coalition government. Uh, the elections, the legislative elections, are held in June. So it's and when not are they decided June? yet? June this year. Yeah, June this year. Yeah, just after. It's always after the presidential elections, which means usually the president has a majority. Um, so that I mean, it's a it's a bit complicated. There was a constitutional reform introduced to to make sure these align um, when the term of the presidency was reduced from seven to five years. But basically, now it's it means that the president typically has a majority because French people give the president their majority. If he said that, how many votes would that get him from Mélenchon's? What is it? Twenty twenty percent, Todd. Yeah, Mélenchon got yeah twenty two, almost twenty two percent. So. Um, I would say um, at the moment we're looking at roughly uh, about forty-five percent of abstention, and among Mélenchon voters, among Mélenchon voters, I think some somewhere along those lines, thirty percent would vote for Macron and twenty-five for Le Pen. 
So it's pretty close in terms of the support for either candidate. The, the big unknown is the abstention. So I think he could get he could get some of that, some of those abstentionists to to change their minds, you know, maybe maybe a few percent, but a few percent might be enough, right? So um, you know, just I don't want to talk too much about numbers, but you know, you, you look at the way that Jacques Chirac defeated Jean-Marie Le Pen, so Marine Le Pen's father, and that was in 2002. It was with 82% of the votes. Uh, last election, um, uh, Macron won with, what was it, 64 or 66% of the votes? I think it was 66, 66, yeah. 66% of the votes. So that's a 16% difference. If we have a 16% difference this time around, it's 50-50, right? Yeah. So it's very, very tight. So he doesn't need much to to win. He just needs to convince enough people. I think a prime minister of the left would do it. And if you were Le Pen, what would you say to Mélenchon voters? Nothing. I would say nothing. I would wait for Macron to make mistakes because at this uh, at this moment in time, it's a very different situation from uh, five years ago. So five years ago, she was 20 points behind in the polls for the second round. And they had a debate where she came across as super aggressive. She was constantly looking at her notes. She didn't know really uh, a lot of the details that the presenters were asking about. She was unprepared. And she came across as someone who wasn't presidential material. She's been training for five years for that second, uh, second round debate because she's thought that she'll be in the second round for five years. So I think she's much more prepared. And I would just wait for Macron to make a mistake. I think it's it's his to lose, right? He makes a mistake. He can fall in the polls enough. She doesn't have to say anything. In fact, the less she says, probably the better, because as soon as people hear more about her projects and ideas, they might change their mind. It, it, I mean, her her goal is lower turnout, presumably, right? I mean, that's what uh, would would favor. That would be the scenario that would favor her. Yeah, would absolutely. It, wouldn't it favor Macron lower turnout? No, no. I think I think Alex is right. I think um, I think lower turnout would actually favor um, favor Le Pen. And in fact, the as I was saying, there's one poll that predicts her win, and it has it has quite high abstention figures. So as long as abstention is high, turnout is low, then she has a, a bit of an edge. So you you don't think this the anti-fascist line, which is the way in which kind of the center has rallied um, since two thousand and two in France? So I mean, you know, the last um, the last twenty years, um, you don't think that works anymore? Well, we'll see, right? It's always a bit difficult to make predictions in politics, but certainly um, from what I'm hearing. From what I'm, I'm seeing, um, you know, on on social media, for example, uh, Mélenchon supporters are outraged. At least some very vocal ones are outraged, calling him a traitor, precisely for for saying not one vote to Le Pen, because they've been saying for five years anything but Macron, yeah. and suddenly someone tells them actually don't vote don't vote for the other candidate, and so they feel like he's a traitor, that he's betrayed them. And, and this very vocal minority, I don't know how big it is. But I mean, the election will tell us, but uh, clearly they don't buy the Republican argument. And you voted for Mélenchon, right? I did, yes. And was it like his pomposity that it drew you or the demagogic, yeah, the demagogic hand gestures? Like, what was it exactly that appealed to you? Yeah, the, the French flag waving in particular, that was my favorite part at the rallies. Um, and uh, yeah, I love the way that he he talks like uh, in a very condescending manner to to people who don't agree with him. I particularly like the time that he said, "I am the Republic," when the police were coming to <laughs> to to get some material from his party headquarters. That that's why I voted Mélenchon. Ah, well, good to know. Thank you. Well, anyway, that's been that's a fantastic um, overview of the first round. So thank you very much for joining us, Charles. And once again, to encourage listeners to take a look at Charles's um, social media for the time of the French presidential election and also the details of his book, which, again, you'll find in the show notes. Thank you for having me.
And listeners, we'll be back with another episode on France tomorrow. Uh, we'll, it'll be uh, looking forward to the second round, delving a little bit more deeply into uh, some of the other questions around this, talking a bit more about techno-populism, about whether this is a techno-populist election. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And again, uh, if you're enjoying what we've been doing over the past five years, or if you've recently joined us but have enjoyed it so far, uh, make sure to drop us a review wherever you can. And we will be back tomorrow. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.